right, just reading where I left, where he left off, uh, with recharged energy, of course. All right. What caused the advance of the poor nations? Modernism, Westernism, call it what you will. There was medical technology that improved sanitation. There was new seeds that improved agricultural yield. There was multinational corporations that brought jobs and access to the markets. There was transistor radios, new roads, airplanes, and in more places than you might think, at least the beginning of a democratic process. Um, interestingly, even a population explosion in the LDCs is the direct result of modernism. Uh, geez. You know, I've heard something completely opposite of this, but anyways. Fewer babies in the third world are dying in infancy due to the advent of modern western nations and medicine, albeit sometimes in rudimentary form. Even the communist world has improved and in some large measure benefited from western primacy. They have shared or stolen our technology. They have benefited from the geopolitical and military stability among the big powers. In 1950, when this western moment began in earnest, the population of the free modern world comprised about 22% of the global population. Today, we are 15%. Uh, projecting current fertility rates just out of the year 2025, the proportion will be about 9%, and that incorporates the United States projected drop in the third world fertility rates. A reasonable extrapolation to the end of the next century using medium UN projections brings the Western proportion down to about 5%. According to UN projections, our share of the world's population will look like the chart on page 47. Well, Western modernism came to dominate the world and improved it. While we comprise somewhere between 22% and 15% of the world, a question arises. Will our values continue to dominate a world where our population shrinks shrinks to 9%, shrinks to 5%, shrinks even lower? Is this harmful economically, personally, geopolitically? Will it yield internal social turmoil? What kind of world will today's children of the West live in tomorrow? We now look at these questions. All right. Part 3, Economic Problems, Chapter 5, What Happens? We continue our speculation. A present here, a very, uh, I present here a very short and very selective history of capitalism. Hold on. Since, since its inception, about 300 years ago, a capitalist country the capitalist countries have been associated almost invariably with rapid growth numbers of people in their home markets. By any standards, these capitalist countries have shown enormous economic success over the years. Thus, three factors. The advent of capitalism, growth of population at home, economic success. End of short, selective history of capitalism. Now, there may not be a cause and effect relationship between capitalism, rapid domestic population growth, and, domestic, and economic success. But if there is some relationship, that aspect of capitalism will surely change. As this change occurs, it has already begun. It will likely change the very nature of capitalist economy. Uh, will such a change harm us? No one knows for sure. We are moving into uncharted waters. There has not been a birth dearth before. How will our economies be different? At the least, there will surely be economic turbulence. There will be dislocations, but will the overall effect of the birth dearth harm us economically? Although there is an argument about it within the economic community, my own sense is that, on balance, the birth dearth will indeed harm us economically. In particular danger, I believe all are those in the business community who don't plan ahead, who don't try to look around the next curve. To sense what will happen to capitalism and capitalist countries, we should try by looking backward. 
Everyone knows about the demographic poetry that has shaped American history. It is rooted in the tale of near near virgin continent with the population of less than a million people, Indians, in the early 1600s. By the time of the first census in 1790, there was about 4 million ex-Europeans and ex-Africans living mostly on the sliver of land on the East Coast. A century later, in 1890, the U.S. population was almost 65 million. The 1990 census is expected to rec record about the quarter of a billion Americans. By almost any reckoning, American demographic history must be counted as one of the great population explosions. What is not realized generally is that the amount of population growth in the rest of the now capitalist world has been dramatic. Even if it not up even if not up to the American scale, here is a simple timeline of Western European nations over the last three hundred years. Uh, estimated population of Western European nations sixteen eighty seventy one million seventeen eighty a hundred million uh, eighteen eighty a hundred and eighty seven million um, 1980, 322 million. I believe that's what that's what it's trying to symbolize here. Um, includes only the current West European democratic and industrial market nations, as defined by the World Bank. Excludes Yugoslavia, Albania, Portugal, and Greece. Oh, the source: Colin McEvity and Richard Jones. Atlas of World Population, 1680 to 1880, um, 1980 World Bank. During this time period, the population of Japan, Japan also grew rapidly, from 27 million to 114 million. And of course, the rate of the growth in numbers in the previously uninhabitable nations of Canada, Australia, and New Zealand was extremely sharp. So during the last 300 years when economic progress in the world was most explosive, there was enormous population growth in those nations where the most vigorous economic system, capitalism, was more potent and prevalent. Let us put a little recent American flesh on these numbers. What did it mean in practice in America? Well, for one, there was always plenty of fresh demand for more housing. For, um, accord accordingly, if an individual or a or a company was in business of building or selling resist residence from slums to penthouses in Connecticut or California there was always a demand for more residences if a person grew or sold or processed food or fiber grain or granola cotton or silk there was always almost a demand for more food or fiber if a company built or sold cars, Model T's or Eldorado's, there was almost always a demand for more cars. If a company designed, manufactured, distri distributed, or sold, uh, or sold word processors or personal computers, IBM's or Apple's, there was almost always a demand for them, for more of them. If the company sold fast food, Wendy's or Taco Bell, there were almost almost always more people to buy the burgers or burritos more always more his emphasis this high growth situation yielded more consequences it didn't mean that every american business venture was a success there were ed sales there were florida land busts there was an overproduction of computers leading to some big corporate losses there were as well a number of good old-fashioned business busting uh, recessions and depressions. But all that notwithstanding, for the most part, there was ongoing decade after decade population growth and a decade after de decade increase of demand for almost everything. This made a lot of people in the business world look like geniuses. Suppose you were a sales manager for a national widget company. Suppose further that because of population growth, the number of people needing widget kept going up by, say, 15% every decade, which has been about the average rate of decennial population growth in the U.S. since 1910. Suppose further that your boss and the corporate shareholders wanted you to increase sales. 
the chances were very good that you would be able to do so. After all, the market right here at home kept growing. If people were leaving the Dakotas or Pennsylvania, or if the growth was very slow in those places, all you had to do was make sure you sold more widgets in the California and Texas to make up for the difference. If you merely kept your share of the widget market, your sales would increase by 15%. You were a hero. Sales went up, total profits went up, even if by some chance your crafty competitors in the widget industry increased sales more rapidly than you did. You could, you could still look pretty good. Suppose your share, a total of the widget market went down a bit. If your share of the widget market went down. Your gross sales would still be likely to go up, perhaps not by the 15% that the speculation had grown, but maybe the 10% or 12%, still not bad. Sales go up, profits go up, dividends go up, good old Joe, he brings home the bacon. That scenario is ending. The Western world, our world, is already moving from the situation of fast growth to slow growth. A no growth circumstance is already in the deck. There will be actual declines in most Western nations unless there are important changes in fertility levels fairly soon. This scenario is quite apparent for Europe. It is also apparent for the US, although the timing is somewhat slower due to our large post war baby boom and continuous immigration. Heroes in the business community will surely be hard to find. In America, a given city or state or region may continue to grow robustly, but as a nation growth is ending. But as a nation growth is ending, uh, we saw in the earlier chart, page 31, the decline in the rate of growth for the Western nations. Look now at the growth rates for the U.S., including estimates for new immigrants, as described in chapter three, because. Many demographers think the U.S. fertility drop may not yet have run its course. An alternative pro pro projection is offered on the facing page to sketch out what happens if we draft down toward West European levels. Growth rates, of course, translate into actual population levels. Chart 5B, page 54, shows what it looks like for the U.S. at the U.N. slash World Bank projection of 1.3. 815 or at a low 1.63 level that the World Bank has also turned out. If um, by chance you think that the U.S. is due for a fertility turnaround, you have better look closely at those official and provisional numbers provided in early 1987 by the National Center for Health Statistics um, and covering the last dozen years. Um, 19... 75, 1.774 uh, TFR, 1976, 1.738 TFR, 1977, 1.790 TFR, 1998, oh shit, 19, uh, 1.0 1.1.780, 19, 79, 1.808, um, 1980, 1.804, 1981, 1.800, 1.803, 1984, 1.806, 1985, provisional, 1.845, 1986, 1.795. Now this is on page 52, by the way, if you want to check it out yourself. Oh, change in the U.S. population by decade, 1850 to 200 and 100. All right, so if you want to see um, chart 5A, it's on page 53, which I have, obviously. You can go look for that. And chart 5B, 
U.S. population 1987 to 200, 100. And this is on page 45. Shit, sorry, no, what am I saying? Not enough coffee in my system. 54. All right. The rates have already barely moved since 1975. The total swing from highest to lowest is very small, only about 5%, and the most recent number is the midpoint of the small swing. The 1981 rate of 1.815 is the U.S. rate used by the U.N. slash World Bank projections and used in this volume. This rate is higher than 1986 estimated provisional rate of 1.9 close to 1.800. The last dozen years in America have yielded up a TFR averaging 1.800, continuing provisional totals for 1985 and 1986.